Hello, hello, hello. We're on interview three of the day. Yeah. And I am joined by the very gorgeous Sarah Baker. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Hello. Lovely to have you here. Thank Even you for having me. <laughs> We're chatting like this online, and you only live about a mile and a half that way. <laughs> I was thinking that earlier. <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, I'm no, very no. well, thank you. I know. Who does that? Who does that? No, I'm very good, except it's very windy and it's giving me big wind hair. But other than that, I'm good. It is very, very windy here today, isn't it? The trees are absolutely yeah. swing. So if you're joining us live, come on in, say hi. It would be lovely to see who's around. It would be lovely to see who's about. And I'm going to be talking to Sarah, who is the therapy biz coach, about the types of things that she does. We're going to be talking about business generally. We're going to be talking about all sorts of things. So come on in and say hi if you're around. It would be lovely, lovely, lovely to see you. Hi, Emma. Come on hi, in. Hi, Emma. <laughs> come on in and say hi because um, – I think that we're going to have a little bit of fun because um, somebody says that she's in a very giggly mood today. <laughs> I am. I don't know why. I'm in a naughty mood. So we might end up being a little bit naughty. And if anything, <laughs> it was her influence, not mine. Nothing to do with me. <laughs> so yeah, You're not a bad influence. No, not at all. <laughs> Sarah, 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 you are, well, you started off your your life, your working life, um, working for government, didn't you? Yes. So I started off wanting to be a psychologist and then ended up somehow sat behind a desk making questionnaires to them that happened. <laughs> but yeah, for 15 years I was a researcher. Yeah, yeah, I won't get those years back. So what sort of things did you research? Uh, I did, oh, my first job was careers, mm. uh, so like job market, it was very dull, then mental health, then education, so I worked for the education department making policy based research that wasn't based on research. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, what, what came about to change your world? What was it that kind of sparked that change? in Korea that changed <laughs> well I always wanted always wanted to help people and I think I got lost oh oh you vanished I'm still here I think I'm still here oh can you hear me I can still hear you mm -hmm. are you there hello. hello who can you hear if you're watching on she's gone I don't know what to do you're watching live now. Um, I can hear have... I can hear us both here. Chat amongst yourselves if I still am actually live. Who can you hear? Da, 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 da. I'm going to have a look on the page. Oh, oh I can't hear Emma at all. I can hear you both. Yeah, I can hear us both. Can I do some hold music? Do, 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 um, do, do, do. Scrolls, not and can hear us. Oh, I can't see or hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, tell us about leaving corporate world and we will see if your sound comes back. There we go. Okay, so I'm just talking to myself. This is really weird. Uh, okay, so I was a researcher. Um, I always wanted to help people. I hated my job. Um, and then my husband left me, it's pretty, it's pretty bluntly. Uh, he moved out after a 15 year relationship and my life was in turmoil. So uh, my anxiety, which I'd had for most of my life, came back uh, with a vengeance, couldn't leave the house, didn't know what to do with myself. And so I had some hypnotherapy 
Um, I had one session. I spent a lot of money on this one session from someone who promised to fix me and make everything better. And actually, they did make it better for a short time. Um, and I saw the power of hypnotherapy. And so as part of my life is in the air, I'm at a crossroads. I decided to um, retrain as a hypnotherapist to help other people. Um, and that's how I got where I am. Can't see <laughs> anyone. It's really weird. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No? And that was about five years ago. So I've been doing hypnotherapy since then. And I love it. I get to talk to people who aren't who have got their eyes closed just like this okay <laughs> so tell us something about your hypno training this is weird okay um so i trained up in glasgow i made some lovely friends i drank a lot of cocktails um i trained uh, in hypnotherapy nlp which is neuro linguistic programming mm -hmm. um i did uh, life coaching so I did this stuff that I thought would make things uh, better for me personally um, and would help me with my anxiety, help me rebuild my life, which it absolutely did. Um, and uh, did this training course with the notion that I would give up my job and start this recession proof business because that's how it was sold to me on my training, that no matter what's going on in the economy, you can have a busy, thriving business. Um, but I didn't. Um, I didn't. I did my training. I left my job. Luckily, got a redundancy payout. Otherwise, I would have gone under a lot quicker. Um, and for two years, I followed the advice that I was given, which was do Google ads, uh, get some uh, leaflets, put them everywhere, get some business cards, tell everyone what you do, and you will have a busy business. And if you don't have a busy business, that's your fault. That's the way I was sold it. So I did that for two years. I. Uh, stickered up my car i spent hundreds of pounds on leaflets that told everybody that hypnosis can help with everything because it can um but that was no way to market i uh went to trade shows and stood there for hours i went to wedding fairs i left my leaflets everywhere like any toilet in darlington would have my leaflets scattered all over them um i would uh i would just spend a fortune every month I, I i did a post through the day where i worked out in one month when i first started i spent 497 pounds on marketing and i made 95 pounds in client charges and um, nothing worked i was really unhappy with my pricing as well so in my lovely training it was recommended that i charge 250 pounds a session and fix everyone in one session and as a therapist that felt really wrong um uh i felt like i was shortchanging people i wanted to check that people were all right i didn't feel like i wanted to bash them with my ego and tell them that if they weren't fixed in an hour it was their fault um so i started charging less i started offering bow and free sessions i started offering taster sessions free demonstrations i did everything humanly possible to get clients in the door and i still didn't have enough clients i didn't have enough clients to live on i didn't have enough clients to feed the kids to put shoes on their little feet um, and things were absolutely dire and it was in that moment that i realized that i had no bloody clue how to run a business i just i didn't i didn't know what i was doing um, i remember sitting at a networking meeting once i think talking to emma saying i'm not a business owner i'm just um, a therapist and i didn't see myself as a business owner i didn't see myself as someone who had a business to run it was all about the next client it was all about that next 50 pound in in my hand so that i could put food on the table it was all really short-term goals and every client was like a massive fight a scrabble to get them through the door um, and life was just really tough and in that moment i realized i had two choices i either give up go back to that soul destroying corporate life and decide that you know just accept that i'm not a business owner and it's not for me or i could learn how to market my business I could learn all that stuff that actually therapists aren't taught. Um, and I learned it and actually it bloody worked. So, uh, which is how I became a therapy business coach because I now give people that bit of information they don't have, which is how to run a business, how to market their business, because they've got the skills, they just need that key to unlock their business. Absolutely. I've just sent uh, Sarah a quick message saying, does she want to go out and try and come back in? So we might lose her for a moment. Uh, while she can't hear me, then I'm going to suggest that she does that. And I think we're going to try again. 
then we'll try to bring her back in so that she can hear me. It's a bit boring, isn't it, if she can't hear me and I have to send her all of these messages um, over on Messenger because then we won't be able to see her and that's a bit pan. Oh, hello. Oh, that was really weird. It was like I was talking to myself in a cave. <laughs> oh. You've done that before, haven't you? I have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to put the diet coke down because Kathy's watching. Oh, it's not diet coke. It's just water in a diet coke can. <laughs> Karen says, "I can't believe the advice on leaflets, Google Ads." So that's awful advice who are you i suppose it's real old school advice isn't it it is it is and the therapists i talk to either get old school advice or they don't get any advice and i don't know what's worse you know they just or they get the tip of an iceberg like you need a website don't start a business till you've got a website well actually don't start a business till you've got clients <laughs> that's, that's probably the worst but the, the website can wait a little bit and i find loads of therapists who are just sat waiting till yeah. everything's ready till they've got their logo till they've got their website now they've got this great big lodge but actually they could have seen 50 clients by then yeah sorry i'm just a little bit distracted on the fact that i'm still in september i did that this morning yeah i was very very puff <laughs> <coughs> we're back we're back and yeah you know, that's a bit <laughs> you went from tell them the story about the people that you used to go and see that were a little drive away from home? Well, I, I was so desperate for clients, so it was all about that next £50 in my hand, that I would drive to their houses. Uh, but I think the most extreme ones were when I opened a clinic in Newcastle, which is about 50 miles away. So I would drive for like an hour or two, depending on the time of day, to get there, to see one client to drive home again. So I'd be at the house for like five or six hours, and I'd have made £50. I think we worked out I was earning about £2.31 an hour. Yeah, and you know it's common, isn't it? It's common that people do that in the therapy space because they are looking for that next client. Yeah, yeah, and I think they think, oh, uh, you know, they don't see the how much it's going to cost them in their time traveling. You know, wear and tear on my poor little car. And um, but also, I don't think as therapists we ever look at how much we earn an hour. So we think about the client in front of us, and we're getting fifty quid. But actually, if you think about the time you market, if you think about the travelling, if you think about the prep, mm. you end up earning less than the minimum wage. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that, you know, if, if we were to take a broad brush approach to it, do you think that the majority of therapists just don't feel equipped to actually market their business as they start out? Yeah, I think I think as well, it's sort of counterintuitive, isn't it? You want more clients, so you talk about all the things you can help with. You talk about, I can help with weight loss and smoking and anxiety. But actually, in that message, nobody hears what they need to hear. So the person that wants anxiety help hears you talking about weight loss and they go elsewhere. So uh, people get really scared about niching and narrowing and becoming an expert in one field because all they see is that I'm cutting down the number of people I can work with. But actually, they'll get more people by being really specific. Yeah. And um, when you kind of started to implement different marketing strategies and you start to think about things quite differently do you think that that really enhanced your confidence as a therapist as well as a business owner yeah because I could be an expert at one thing and I could talk about it and it was that thing so for me it was anxiety that's what who I started helping was people with anxiety and it meant talk to them about how they were feeling and their struggles and really connect with them before they even booked up with me so a lot of that relationship building that happened in a first session had already happened mm. without them even talking to me they just got it through my marketing which was magic it was lovely mm. and what do you think that the main kind of takeaways from working in that way were for you you know did you have lots of little kind of light bulb epiphanies going off as you did that yeah, I think for me, what happened was I learned that it's not about telling people you can fix their stuff, which is what I'd always been taught. You know, you fix someone, you get rid of their thing. But actually, it's about taking them from a place where they feel really shitty and miserable and awful and showing them that just by working with you, they can go to this new place, which is lovely and happy. And, and that was really nice because they go on a journey when they're in therapy anyway. So this was that journey that already started. Yeah. 
And what was the turning point that you wanted to help other therapists with this? I think it was when I worked out that you could you could help people in your pajamas. <laughs> so, so we know I'm a bit lazy, but when I worked out that actually not every don't nod, <laughs> that not every therapeutic relationship has to be face to face in a room, and actually I could be helping people from all over the world even when I wasn't working, by doing online stuff. And that, for me, transformed everything. It saved my business, so that that was a massive thing. Yeah. And not in like, oh, I made millions of pounds overnight. Like I literally could buy the kids a treat, take them to Pizza Hut. We went out for pancakes. You know, it wasn't massive stuff, but it was stuff that we'd been missing for so long. Uh, but working out that I could help people online was, was definitely the turning point. But you talked about Pizza Hut and you talked about pancakes there. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear more about that. Oh, the pancake one's probably the best. That's my like rags to witches story is my pack penny list of pancakes. So we'd gone to Centre Parks. My sister and my mum had paid for me and the kids to go. And we'd gone and all they wanted to do was go to that pancake house. I don't get savoury pancakes, they're just minging. But anyway, they wanted to go. And um, and I promised them all weekend. And while we were there, some money had come out of my camp that I wasn't expecting. And I literally had about 16p left in my purse. So I was ready to go and tell them downstairs that we couldn't go. And my kids are great. They'd have had a tear and then they'd be fine. But I really wanted to take them. And uh, as I was walking down the stairs to tell them we couldn't go, my phone pinged. And I literally sold my first ever online weight loss program for 50 quid. And I had 50 quid in my purse to go. To, so we went to the, we went to the pancake. That makes me very tearful. But it was, it was a massive turning point because until then, we'd literally been living on the bread line. We'd literally been, you know, I couldn't take them out for treats. When we went to Pizza Hut, we hadn't been out. I mean, I'm a single mum, so it's all on me. Um, we hadn't been out for tea for over 18 months because I just couldn't afford it. So those little things, although they seem little at the time, were massive. The pancake thing well, was literally my, like, I've made a million pounds. I, I just felt like the richest woman in the world. And I wasn't even working. Yeah. yeah. And you were you were there on holiday, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And it was just utter magic. And when I realised that I could do that, I could have a business that paid me even when I wasn't working, that's when I really shifted how I run my business. And that's what I wanted to teach the therapist is that it doesn't have to be you know, there are only so many hours in the day. There's only so many clients you can see in a day. So you've got this limit on your earning potential. And having online programs means that you can smash that limit without exhausting yourself and burning yourself out. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that was kind of the turning point for you that you wanted to help and support other um, therapists. And do you predominantly work with hypnotherapists? Um. Um, predominantly, I suppose, yeah, I've got a lot of EFT, I've got a lot of people who do Reiki, but yeah, I suppose most of them, even if they do other stuff, are mostly hypnotherapists, yeah. Cool. And, you know, what's kind of the, the biggest piece of advice that you could give somebody who has currently got a hypnotherapy business um, or therapeutic business generally to start to, you know, really make a change in what they're doing? I think uh, there's, there's loads of it. Um, <laughs> I think the main bit for me is that there is a saturated market out there. Like there are hundreds of therapists training every week. There's therapy schools opening everywhere. Hypnotherapists are becoming trainers. So everybody wants to be a therapist and people get really scared and they try and fit in with what everyone else is doing. So they'll look at, you know, how much people are charging locally. They'll look at what's on people's websites. And my, my advice would be, to really be successful, don't try and be like anyone else. If you can be you and openly you in your business, so no hiding, no, you know, having a logo, no. I, I mean, someone messaged me the other day and I couldn't work out if they were a man or a woman from their, from their Facebook page because wow. it was so generic. And as a client, and I always try and look at things with the eyes of a client, as a client, I, I want to know the person that I'm working with. I don't want it to be a massive company. I don't want it to be faceless. I want to see you and your wrinkles and your grey hair and your roots and your slippers, if it's me. <laughs> and I'm under the desk. I'm not wearing them today, I'm just putting it out. But yeah, but to be you in your business is the only way to stand out in that saturated market. That would be my main bit of advice. Cool. And what if people were looking to train in these kind of therapeutic genres? What would you be saying to them? I would say not to be blinded by the hype 
So a lot of trainers want you to do other courses with them. They want you to mentor with them. They'll tell you how they made seven zillion pounds in six seconds. They will tell you how they're the best. They will whack you with their ego in a lot of cases. And I think it's just to keep your sensible glasses on. And I didn't do that for a long time. I was really blinded by the the promises and the, you know, you can make it work, give up the job, oh, you know, stuff. I mean, having looked back on it now, I think I would have thought twice about doing it. I'm so glad I did take that path, but I really would have thought about it. I think it's it's to remember that it's harder than people make it sound. It's not impossible, but it takes work. It's not going to happen overnight. And you have to be consistent and show up, but don't be blinded by promises. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it. I suppose it's about being more than a therapist. You don't have, you know, the skill itself is <laughs> lovely, but like you said, you didn't ever look at yourself as a business owner. No. No. And I think a lot of therapists, and when I first started doing this, I got quite a lot of abuse from people who would say, you know, I'm in therapy to help people. I'm not in it to make money. But actually that's lovely, but it's a bit, naive you know you have to earn money to live you're entitled to earn money and i say to my therapist all the time you're not just a therapist you transform lives you heal hurts you end addictions you know you've got this power to transform someone's life completely why would you not charge for that yeah and you know if you don't charge for it you then can't do more of it yeah yeah that's the big thing is that you know if you then have to go out and, and work and you know, juggle a few jobs or whatever it might be because you aren't charging or you aren't charging enough, then actually what you're doing is you're limiting the amount of people that you can help with your therapy. Yeah. And there are people sat out there waiting for you, waiting for you to talk to them, waiting for you to get your marketing message to them, and they're desperately looking for you, not the other sea of therapists out there, but you. And then if you don't have... The, you know if you're not charging if you don't have the money to market if you are doing six other jobs then you're not serving you're not helping those people and you know the the interesting thing is is that i think that a lot you said there if you don't have the money to and you know i know that what we we've i've seen you write about and we've spoken about before is actually if they change the way that they do it it actually costs them less money yeah, this is a big one for me. I like to do things on not on the cheap, but I don't I don't see the point of spending. So I used to spend I used to spend £150 every month on Google AdWords. I don't know what I was spending it on. I only did it because somebody told me I should. And I didn't get any clients. I spent over a year on Google Ads. So that's over a thousand pounds on Google Ads that never brought me a client. My big thing with therapists is and anyone in business, if you are spending more than you're getting back from that thing, then that thing isn't working for you. And I totally believe that you can market your business on a shoestring. It doesn't cost the earth. Someone messaged me last week saying that they'd been advised it would cost them £500 to develop an online course to sell. Mm. And I wrote a blog that did it for free. It, you know, you don't have to spend a fortune to produce good stuff. It's not that it's any less valuable or any less good. It's just you're doing it cheaper. And I, I, I like, I'm Northern, I like cheap. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bad <laughs> Absolutely. So when you are, you know, working with therapists, what do you see them, you know, what, what's the biggest thing that they kind of fall over themselves with? What's the biggest tripping point in their businesses? Is it? So there's probably a couple. There's the need for everything to be perfect. That's definitely one. So I'll, like I said at the beginning, I'll have a business when my website's ready. I'll have a business when I've got my logo done. I need to get my branding done so that I can see clients. None of that is important if you're showing up as yourself and talking to people about their stuff. So that's the first thing where people get really stuck. The second thing is that people think it's going to be harder than it is. So mm -hmm. the techie side of stuff, so they, you know, they don't want to blog because it feels like it's impossible and they don't know what to do, or they don't want to create a freebie because they don't understand how to do a sign up form. So it's it's that techie stuff that stands in the way of creating their marketing journey. So they're, they're sort of probably more, the two biggest things. Do you think that they they find the whole business thing just a bit like, I don't do that, I'm a therapist, and that's really hard. And, you know, that there's a bit of a block there between the day-to-day -day running of their business and the business marketing and things like that. 
yeah yeah and often when i work with with therapists the first thing i say to them is what is your like income goal for the next year and all of them laugh at me they don't have one they don't think about their business in long-term ways so they'll know that they've got three clients booked in this week but they won't know how much they're going to earn this month they won't know if they can pay the bills so it's very reactionary and and they'll get to the end of the month they'll panic their marketing will become panicked because they're desperate for those clients booked in so it's always kind of the business is is getting away from them rather than them running the business yeah 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 and when you start working with people, what what kind of um, jigsaw pieces are you looking to bring in place for them? So for me, it's about seeing it as a business. So what is your income goal? What do you need to, cre- to create in your business to give up that day job or get rid of that second job? Or a lot of my therapists feel like it's make or break. So, you know, if this doesn't work, I need to go get a job. Then we look at, well, how is that possible? You know, if you want to earn £30,000 a year, that's 13 clients a week if you charge 50 pounds an hour that's a bloody lot of clients to find and market so we look at you know do you need to put your prices up do you can you create online stuff to be selling can you is there some other avenue you can bring in but then also for me it's it's all about the marketing journey it's all about my magic triangle Um, and lots of therapists have social media magic triangle and lots of my therapists have social media Hmm? tell us about this triangle Oh, my magic triangle. Uh, it's it's very technical. Um, so lots of my therapists have social media, so they'll be on Facebook, and they'll often say, oh, I've tried what you've suggested about Facebook, and it's not working. And they, what they mean by that is clients aren't booking in from that Facebook post. And what I try and t- tell them is that it's not, that's too big a jump. So you're expecting people to give you their stuff open up to you share with you their innermost thoughts and weirdness and you can't expect them to do that after one social media post so you have to take them on this journey you have to blog so that they start to get to know you and see your expertise you have to have a freebie to offer them which is a decent freebie not just an ebook about anxiety but something that gives away a bit of your therapy for them to try you have to have a mailing list so that you can talk to them and you have to have a website that talks to them and not, you know, isn't 7,000 words about everything you can help with and terrifies them. And only when you have those stages in place that people can walk through will they go to your diary. If you are just on social media, it's too big a leap. You're not going to have any clients. Mm-hmm. And do you find that a lot of the time it is just a matter of putting the building blocks and starting that build? Yeah. Yeah, putting it in place and keep doing it because often, you know, we'll write a blog. I've written a blog now, but actually you need to write a blog a week or a blog a month. You've got a mailing list that you mail like once every three months, but actually that's not building and nurturing that relationship. I think with therapy, it's such a different um, a different audience that you're talking to. So normally with business, you're crowd building and you're creating these fans or this tribe who are going to love your stuff and repeatedly buy from you. But actually in therapy, that they're going to sign up for to work with you. You're going to help them, fix them, and they're going to go off on their merry way. So you have to constantly bring new people to your pool of potential clients. And that, although the building blocks are in place, you have to keep at it. Yeah, the thing is, isn't it? it you know, it's the aim for you is to, to let that client go as quickly as possible. Yeah. As a therapist. So once you've let that client go, you've got to be bringing others in. And, you know, you probably have a business that is, I don't don't want to use the word churn, but, you know, you don't have that element of of massive client retention because your aim is to to sort them out, seal them off and let them go. Yeah. Yeah. And you talk that they'd like, you know, refer to friends and family, but often people don't even want to tell you they've seen a therapist. So you can't rely on referrals. You can't rely on repeat business. So it is about, and I, I talk about a pool because I like the idea of, you know, a pool is fluid, water runs in, it runs out. Not everybody will want to work with you in that pool. But if you keep talking and building that pool, people will book up. Yeah. So when you're, um, you know, working really hard with with your therapy, clients and you're starting to you know show them the different things that they need to put into place do they do they kind of get that handle on starting <laughs> building blocks in quite quickly 
I think it depends. I think it depends how many blocks they've got in the way of that success. So often they'll have been at it a while before they come to me um, and they'll have talked themselves into that place where they can't do it. You know, it works for your blogs down the road, but it doesn't work for me. They've got themselves into a very stuck place. And so it depends how you can unstick them. And for some people, that's really quick. That just takes a quick, you know, kick up the bum and uh, you can absolutely do this. For some, it takes a massive mind um, set shift. So I've got therapists where they'll have an income goal for the month and they'll instantly follow that income goal with, but I'll never make that. So mm. then it's about, you know, getting rid of those limited beliefs and getting rid of that that self-talk in the head and for others it's just about knowing the techie stuff so I love the fact that I teach really simply because that's how I learn so everything I teach is very follow me step by step guys so sometimes it's just a case of them knowing how to do the techie stuff so different mm-hmm. therapists different different journeys mm-hmm. and do you think and it, it might be a bit of a controversial one do you think that oh. therapists tend to forget about themselves a little bit yes yes if i had a pan for every time <coughs> i've heard a therapist say oh i tell my clients that but i don't do it myself i'd be a very rich woman because i think you know therapists often you know have got families they've got other stuff going on they've often got second jobs or the day job they they put everything else first and themselves last and then they burn out, they get ill, they can't cope. I mean, a big thing for me is what if you get ill or you can't work for some reason, how does your therapy business sustain itself? So I couldn't work at the beginning of this year for four months and didn't see a client face to face and my passive income, my online income kept me going. And so that's what I try and encourage therapists to think about, you know, you are the main commodity in your business without you, you don't have one. So how is your business gonna survive if you fall asleep at your desk or you get ill or what if you you know break your leg and you can't work how is that going to work so it's about them thinking about themselves but also thinking about themselves as the key to their business yeah yeah and you know when you're looking at um you know i kind of want to look at at the mix of how you encourage your therapists to work so are you looking at you know a certain percentage of it being um online certain percentage of it being offline is there something you know that they should be thinking about no actually i don't work like that because for me what i like to know from therapists is what they want their business to look like because every therapist will be different so for me i i wanted to do more online and see less face-to-face but for some of my therapists face-to-face is the thing that they love it's the thing that sets the fire off in their belly so what i get them to look at is what they need to create in terms of face-to-face clients and then how can we supplement that or support that with an online income and also to think about a lot of therapists think about online stuff as 9.99 audios and i get a lot of this oh it's never going to make me a fortune no 9.99 audios won't but you could create an anxiety program that's four modules for 149 pounds you could create a weight loss one for 200 pounds it's about thinking about programs and bigger much bigger sort of uh, productions that you're going to sell rather than thinking about those smaller audios Mm, yeah and when you look at kind of all of the different ways that that they bring together do you think that there's um an increasing amount of people who are doing more online stuff rather than face to face i think it's I think generally as an industry, there's a lot more online stuff because I think people have realised there's this whole self-help market where people will spend, you know, £20 on a Paul McKenna book, but they won't spend £50 on seeing a face-to-face therapist. So I think people have realised there is an avenue to tap into. It, I think it depends on the therapist. Some are very traditional and will, you know, you can only build rapport if you're face-to-face and you have to have 12 sessions. And, and there are others that, you know, are very much more open to the idea that you can work in different ways i mean some therapists won't even work over skype they're very very traditional so it's it's i suppose it's about where you trained when you trained how savvy you are with the online world i mean for us Mm -hmm. online is just it's just there isn't it we're used to it but for older therapists it's not something they've thought about it's not something they're comfortable with Um, and so for them it's probably more about face to face Mm -hmm. cool and they can definitely make massive inroads by building, 
you know, those kind of um, relationships with their crowd and getting more of a rapport and actually knowing who they're talking to. That's it. Yeah. It's about being ballsy enough to talk to the people who are going to be in your pool of potential clients rather than trying to talk to the world. Yeah. And do you see any big mistakes that, you know, are kind of the common ones as they start to step into, right, I'm going to make this work? I think a lot of people still go back to that whole, I'm Sarah and I'm a hypnotherapist and I can help. It's too generic. And even when they start to focus on their marketing, that's their go-to marketing message is that I can help. But actually, if there's seven zillion therapists in your area all saying the same thing, how do they choose? If you look at like the hypnotherapy directory, for example, 99% of the entries of the therapists in that directory are the same. So it's yeah. about doing something that stands out. It's about using different languages. It's about talking to them about how they feel right now and how you can make it better. And when you start to connect to their emotions, that's when they listen. That's when they start to think, oh, this is the person for me. And it's about showing up as well. So like I said, it's not just about Facebook. You want to be appearing in front of those people in tons of different ways so that those clients start to think, oh, it's a sign from the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you are coming to me as a sign from the universe. Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> so, um, do you find that a lot, of, a lot of the work that you do with with your um, therapy biz owners is is about perception and mindsets and that kind of thing? Yeah, I think mindset's coming more and more into it, actually. It's, I've definitely seen an increase recently of people just stuck in their thoughts before they even get to the sort of marketing malarkey. And I'm a, I'm a big believer. I'm sure Kate, I didn't see Kate's talk earlier, but I'm sure she talked about, you know, that law of attraction and that, you know, that idea that we attract what we focus on. So when they're focused on being in the lack and not having clients and you know, struggling, they're just going to get more of it. So for me, it's all about transforming that so they start to see, see themselves as a successful business owner and not just a therapist. Yeah, that is that just a therapist thing, isn't it? Which is exactly yeah. how you felt when, you know, yeah. when we had that first conversation about, you know, you, you doing other things and you starting to, you know, take your business forward when you didn't feel like a business owner. Yeah. yeah yeah and all the time you feel like that you're, you're not a business owner because you're you don't do the things you need to run a business so i never did my accounts you know i i was really unproductive in the way i worked i used to work on the sofa watching jeremy kyle as yes you know <laughs> you know i didn't see myself as a business owner i was just hanging around waiting for that next client to book in mm. yeah how quickly do you think that people can turn it around so I would say, um, I would say three months ish is the time it takes for your marketing message to start to get heard. Anybody that starts to tell you can do it overnight is just fibbing, I think, because you need to be seen. You need to. Oh, lost you! I've lost. Oh, you're back. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> um, but also, um. But also, in terms of stuff like online stuff, people think, oh, you know, it's going to take me a year to build an online program or project. In my club this month, in my success school, I've given them a month to plan and create an online project. And, and I guarantee by the end of those 30 days, they'll all have created something. So it's about, yes, it takes time for your marketing message to get out there, but then it's about you doing the stuff in the background while that's working to actually have something to sell at the end of it. Yeah, you can do that simultaneously. You don't have to do one then the other, do you? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what a lot a lot of therapists sort of just one thing at a time. Whereas you know me, I've got like twenty seven things going at once, <laughs> juggling them all. Let's do it all. Let's do it well. <laughs> what do you like to do away from helping, supporting, and inspiring these gorgeous therapists? What, you mean in real life? In real life, what do you like to do in, in real life? life? Oh, uh, well, I've got two little people, so they keep me busy. Um, I like to swim. I, I like to do yoga, but sometimes I just like to put on my yoga pants. And, and that's pretend. what I was like. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I've got a little puppy, so walking the dog and getting lost. I like to be outside. I like to be by the sea. Um, yeah, I just, I like, yeah, outside is good. You're pretty good at getting lost as well, aren't you? Very good at it. Yeah, I was born with no internal compass. <laughs> no, not whatsoever. And the sat nav hates me, so the sat nav deliberately gets me lost. <laughs> no, you just don't listen to it. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's just like me. <laughs> I also can't park either, but we don't need to go into that. Definitely can't park. I will tell you that you definitely, definitely can't park. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to open up the doors. Does anybody want to ask me or Sarah anything? Does anybody want to talk about anything particular? Does anybody want to chat about anything at all that, that's come up for them that they would like a bit of help and support with or advice with? Come on and pop your questions into the comments if there is anything that is coming up for you that you would like to chat about because that would be great. And I'm going to ask Sarah some of the big kind of takeaway tips for therapists. So if we've got some therapists listening and, you know, they're thinking, right, OK, I'm ready. I'm ready to make a difference. What would be your kind of first action list that you would give them? So my action list is always your foundations. So your who, your what and your how. If you don't know what they are, then you have no foundations to build your business on. So who are you talking to? And that's not your typical, you know, ideal client, Sheila from Macclesfield who's got two kids and a puppy. That's about the, the sort of people you like to work with. So it might be men, it might be women, it might be kids. But who who are you trying to attract to work with? Then what are they struggling with? So those people can't you know, have 7,000 different things going on for you to market to them. So you have to find a common theme that runs through them. So that might be that they're all business owners. It might be that they're all mums. It might be that they all struggle with anxiety. It might be that they're all comfort eating. But when you work out that what, you can talk to them about it. Yeah. And everything else becomes easier. Your marketing becomes easier. Your message becomes easier. And then how can you make it better? So not what is your list of qualifications not what is in your toolbox because if you took your car to the garage and the mechanic stood there and showed you every tool he was going to use to fix your car you'd, you'd get really angry with him and probably shout so what what how, how can you fix their thing yeah. how are you going to make it feel better how is life going to be when they get rid of that thing and if you can show them a house or i was doing a class this week and i said it, they're in a really dark place now but even if it's just a flying phobia their thing will be affecting them otherwise they wouldn't be looking for help um, and your job is to shine a light over there and say, actually, if you work with me, that's what life can look like. And if you do that, you work up your who you want and how everything else in your business becomes a zillion times easier. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose they, they, they're then going to how do they fit into that and, you know, what are they inspired by and and how does that feel? Do a lot of your therapists get caught up in you know, I need to have this brand or I need this brand name, that kind of thing. And not so much branding, actually, but websites definitely have got to have, you know, my website has to tell you everything I do. So the amount of web addresses I've seen that are like 42 words long, <laughs> you know, Sarah Baker, NLP, hypnotherapy, darling. You know, it's like they've put all the search keywords into their web address. And then you just think, well, actually, I just, I just want to know you. So their, their website traffic could be rubbish because someone spelt something wrong. Yeah. So for them, it's definitely websites. And then, you know, taglines are a big thing as well. Taglines drive me mad. Taglines won't bring you clients. They're, they're lovely to have a tagline, but they're, they're not something to keep you stuck um, and not seeing clients. Yeah, I hear you. Absolutely. And, you know, if um, if they are looking at kind of websites and things, is there a, a common sort of downfall that they have when it when that that is the thing? Is it that they just don't do anything because they don't have one or are they putting together websites that are, like you say, wordy, personalityless, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's both. A lot of them will wait until they've got a website. So they'll talk about this big launch. I'm going to launch my website. But actually that client who's searching for you right now just wants to find a facebook page just wants to find out where you're based just wants to find out your phone number um so they get very hung up on that but then also a, 
a while ago, I suppose when I trained, the advice was still the same. It was tell everyone that you can help with everything and list everything. So my first website, you know, it had all the things I could help with. So I stopped smoking and then a little explanation about how hypnotherapy can help stop smoking. Then the same for anxiety. And then, you know, I had about 40 things on my website. But actually as a client, it, yeah. I don't want to read all that. I just want you to tell me that you're going to fix my thing. And it's why having a niche and that narrowing makes life easier. Um, because if you're talking to your who about their what on your website, then they're going to book in. Yeah, yeah. Because then they've got the why. Yeah. Yeah. So it all works together, doesn't it? Yeah. Really? Um, so um, I think that lots of therapists out there obviously will kind of be in that place that you were in where you were doing the ad word type of stuff you were doing the other type of stuff did you do much in-person uh, networking I used to go to a networking meeting every month which I hated because my social anxiety displays itself in standing up in front of people. I can sit quite happy like this, but you ask me to stand up in a room around a table and I would make every excuse under the sun to like go to the loo or to have nosebleeds or, you know, <laughs> to fall off a chair. <laughs> Um, and I used to hate it and so the, and actually those networking events they were a lovely lunch I met some lovely people but um in terms of business it didn't bring me anything in fact it brought me one client and that was the daughter of somebody who was at a networking thing but I did that for a year and, and I got one client out of it so I think it's about working out where your time's best spent you know if you enjoy networking go ahead and do it but don't expect to get clients from it B and I was another one so I got invited to a B and I meeting but actually as a therapist it's not the same as getting a plum around. It's about, it's much more raw and emotional. So people want to find them through their own means, not have that recommendation. You know, recommendations are great, but, but you still want to connect with that person before you commit. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, the right networking meeting, there would have been lots to do and, you know, clients there and, you know, you'd be able to find that. But, you know, there's certain... I think lots of therapists will probably go out and just find a networking meeting rather than thinking yeah. about the fix of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about finding the right one for you. From a local perspective, is there anything that they can be actively doing that most of your lot don't do to market locally? I think looking at what's available, so Facebook now to a local ad, which I love, where you can just decide the radius you want to advertise to. That's simple. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to do Facebook ads, but it costs a pound a day. It's much cheaper than Google AdWords. You can also keep an eye on what you're spending your money on, whereas Google used to just send me a bill, and I'd be like, what the hell? Um, but, you know, things like uh getting known locally is, is important. So, you know, things like Twitter hours. I've got loads of quite a lot of work from the darlington biz hashtag um because people would i was the only hypnotherapist on there so people would just recommend me in groups and stuff so there's stuff like that but then be aware of how what other therapists are around and what they're doing because you don't want to be doing the same thing as them because then everyone will just see you as the same person so it's about it's about finding out what's what's going to work for you in your business some of my therapists work together so they've got you know they join up with other therapists and they work you know, they, they spread their marketing that way. That works. Um, I think it's just about getting known for, for what you do and not just focusing on the local. Building up your national and international pool of potential clients is just as important if you're going to sell online. Yeah, absolutely. Do you need to have a very expensive therapy chair? <laughs> That's my favourite question ever. No, you bloody don't. <laughs> have a very expensive website no 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 we don't no Do you have to spend a lot of money on advertising no is there anything that you should invest in good training insurance an ikea chair you don't your chair does not make you a better therapist i want to announce this to the world this was a conversation in a group recently where some idiots <laughs> said that if you didn't spend a thousand pounds on a chair you were a crap therapist uh ah. that's not true yeah 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 i had to spend a thousand pounds on more mine which are in the background are from ikea i think they were 60 quid each but um no no you just get good training uh and have the confidence that you can help people. That's all you need. Yeah, 
yeah i think it's yeah it's invest in yourself isn't it yeah which is a a biggie yeah, good biggie. and what would you say to people that if they are a little bit stuck in that kind of i, I can't invest in myself i can't invest in any more training i've done so much kind of thing I think it's a big it was a massive one for me it was like you know i either carry on down this road and just fingers crossed something gets better but really deep down i knew that was never going to happen you know i've been doing the same thing for two years and it was pants so it was about taking that chance to invest i would say find someone you feel comfortable with don't be like i said earlier don't buy promises that people can't back up don't, uh, don't you don't have to invest a fortune to make a massive difference i think i invested 300 pounds over six months you know think about it in terms of what what it will bring you in terms of clients so you know if it's 75 pounds a month and you charge 75 pounds a client you only need to find one more client from that investment and it's paid for itself it's about looking at the big oh she's gone is she coming back are you coming back Hello. <laughs> um, it's about, yeah, it's about just seeing that you're worth investing in. And also, yes, you've spent a fortune on your therapy training. But actually, if you're not seeing clients at therapy training, it's going to waste. You're just it's gathering dust. Eventually, you won't have the confidence to see clients because it's been so long. Um, and I see that a lot. I see a lot of therapists who've you know, not seen a client for six months and they're terrified to, to work with one. So it's about just understanding that sometimes investing in your business is the difference between you having a client filled diary and you having tumbleweed rolling through it. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So would anybody like to ask us anything? Because I think we are coming towards the end. Hayley says, oh, networking is my absolute favourite. But yes, yeah, spot on, it depends on um, if your customers are there. Yeah, you know, I think that, Sometimes if it depends, I think I've seen this a few times and you know, sometimes you can go out networking and it can be the wrong group, but you can go and go, actually, I just want to be around some people because being self-employed yeah. can be quite lonely, but yeah. you know, not dressing it up as something else. It might be more peer support. It might be just to get out. It might be to be around business owners. But yeah, if you're looking at it from a client specific point of view, then I think you've got to look at client specific actions that meet with your client and who you're talking to. Um, because, yeah, it, you know, there's there's uh, different ways and means of of looking at it and dressing it up. You know, don't call it something that it isn't. I suppose it's that Facebook yeah. thing, isn't it? It's like, you know, you can tell me that you've been on Facebook all day, but how much of that was actually work? Yeah. Yeah, and I used to just go for the lunch. The lunch was really nice, and that's why I was open and honest about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to go somewhere for dinner. <laughs> I'm always up to going somewhere for dinner. Yeah. So there you go. Right, I think that um, nobody's got any questions, but it was absolutely lovely to have you here today, Mrs. Thank you for having me. <coughs> I can go and cough now. You're... Um, <laughs> Your feet haven't got too hot, have they? No, no, no. They've stayed cool today, yes. It's a bit later in, on in the day that I get a bit overheated. She gets very angry if she's got hot feet, people. I do. I have to strip off on a Facebook Live. That's what I normally do. <laughs> Love it. Well, thank you for joining us, my darling. It's been absolutely You're very amazing. welcome. And um, I am coming next at quarter past one with the very, very gorgeous, Vicky Nicholson. So I will see you all in 15 minutes or so after I've had another wee and made another brew. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Speak soon. Bye. See you later. Bye.